Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon. I'm Dennis Galecki and welcome to the 397th Imagine Buffalo program and another virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne as I call the acronym, and imaginelifelonglearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speakers shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels. As a reminder, we'll be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. at the same link with a great lineup of local speakers. Now, today is the fourth Tuesday of the month, so our primary Cezanne theme is nature and science, while our Imagine theme is to imagine greater Buffalo as a premier cultural and nature center. Today's featured speaker will help us do just that. Uh, Marissa Wigglesworth, current, Marissa <laughs> Wigglesworth currently serves as president and CEO of the Buffalo Museum of Science and Tift Nature Preserve. She is just the second woman president of the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences 150 plus year history. Prior to moving to Buffalo, Marisa worked on behalf of nonprofits, including the Franklin Institute and the National Aquarium. She has helped these and other organizations raise more than $150 million for capital projects and programs. Her experience includes establishing a first ever diversified sustainable fundraising program for a national organization leading multiple strategic planning efforts and launching numerous programs to engage underrepresented audiences in STEM activities, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math. While not a scientist by training, Marisa has a great appreciation for science and the scientific process regarded as an effective speaker on the importance and impact of informal STEM learning opportunities, Marisa assertively promotes the sentiment that museums are for everyone. And now let's welcome Marisa Wigglesworth, who is going to talk about the role of a science museum in the 21st century. Marisa. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you all a little bit today about the role of the Science Museum today. Um, I thank the Imagine series and our terrific friends at the library. I'm going to uh, pull up uh, some slides, share my screen, and away we will go. So I always begin by telling you that I believe science creates opportunities and shapes our world. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about the role of science museums today. Fundamentally, science museums make science accessible, help people develop fundamental life and employment skills, stand as a resource for accurate science content and information, offer engaging and entertaining programming for all ages, and ultimately do no less than inform greater human knowledge. So what is a scientist? 
you are likely familiar with research, drawless scientist research that's being conducted for decades. Young people are asked to draw a scientist. And of course, decades ago, most of those scientists were men wearing a lab coat. In recent years, we've seen more and more female scientists. There was a meta study done a meta-analysis in 2018, looking at five decades worth of this research, 78 different samples with almost 21,000 participants. And what we saw from that meta-analysis is that more recent years, fewer and fewer participants drew male scientists. That's progress. Women can be scientists. What we also see, however, is that the age of the participants um, determines their likelihood to draw a male scientist. As students get older, they're more likely to draw a male scientist. Young people know anybody can be a scientist. Of course, women can be scientists as well as men. But the societal indicators that are still prevalent today change that influence and tell people that a scientist is a man. I Googled scientist on uh, scientists and images. The first seven images of scientists that, when, that come up when you ask Google for images are these. And the next seven images and the seven Im images beyond that don't look very much different. And this man particularly with his eureka moment and his mad scientist hair is really quite an extraordinary stereotype. And while these pictures tell us that scientists today can be any age and of any racial background or ethnicity, these pictures also tell us that the process of science can only look one way, right? It happens in a lab by people wearing a lab coat with what looks to be very sophisticated equipment. That's what science looks like today. Well, what pop culture tells us about scientists isn't very much more helpful. I give you Sheldon Cooper of The Big Bang Theory, um, Penelope of Criminal Minds, Abby of NCIS. Now, they're not all chemists, which is terrific, Sheldon being an academic, and I think Penelope is a technical analyst and Ab Abby is a forensic scientist. But, but let's think about these characters. They do share something in common. While they are all brilliant and very capable and skilled at their jobs, they're all a little bit quirky, a little bit other. They're outsiders, they're lovable nerds. While we do love them as characters, not a one of them is generally positioned as the leading man or lady or the hero of the story. Scientists, what's a scientist really? Let's move aside all of these pop culture indicators. What's a scientist really? Well, at the Buffalo Museum of Science, this is what science looks like. These are people doing science, each and every one of them doing basic science skills in a variety of settings. At the Buffalo Museum of Science and Science Museums today, we make science accessible. All of these people are doing science because science is about everyday processes. Here is a listing of science process skills starting at the top with observation, looking at the world around us, and then measuring is something bigger or smaller than something else. Sorting and classifying, are these two alike or are they different? Inference, I think that predicting. If I drop my pen from holding it up here, I predict it will fall to the ground. And then experimenting by doing so and ultimately communicating what we've learned. This is the process of science, and we are all scientists. So look at these images from the Buffalo Museum of Science again, and think about the process of science process skills happening in each one. Communication, observation, the skulls on the table there, perhaps they're classifying and sorting. What's this young man doing? Is he inferencing? He is observing? Each of these pictures demonstrates everyday people doing science interpreting, experimenting in any kind of setting, independently or in groups, doing the kinds of things that most of us do a lot of every day. 
because science is really a part of how we can all behave every day. And it's part of what we do every day. So one of the primary things that I believe science museums do is we make science accessible. Science doesn't need to be only for the other people, those lovable nerds who are super smart. And science certainly doesn't only need to take place in a lab by people wearing white lab coats. Though, of course, this is our director of collections, Kathy Leacock, who does have her careful gloves on. So one of the primary um, priorities that I believe a science museum does and that I believe is a priority for the Buffalo Museum of Science is helping people develop what we call STEM thinking skills. And for me, that boils down to the ability to ask good questions, think critically, make comparisons, and solve problems. And it's this fundamental aspect of what we offer to all visitors and program participants that encouraged us to develop and adopt our Find Why tagline. Because at the Buffalo Museum of Science, we encourage all of our guests to take the lead in their own investigation and discovery and find questions themselves or find answers themselves to a variety of questions that are all around them. And when you can do this, when you have the ability to think critically, to really observe and to understand what two things are alike and what two things are different, particularly in this time of a proliferation of false information, of denialism of science and facts at large. The ability to do these things brings extraordinary power. And I offer, it, these are fundamental life skills that we are helping people to develop. According to the Pew Research Center, about seven in 10 Americans express at least some interest in science news. And in fact, more people express at least some interest in science news than they do in business or entertainment or even sports news. At the same time, only a, um, only a small percentage of people actively seek out science news. Most people happen upon it. Now let's think about that. With the incredible proliferation of false information, bad information, intentionally incorrect information in the world, if you are happening upon science news, or in fact, news of any topic area, how are you able to discern fact from fiction? How are you able to really move through life knowing that you're able to embrace what's real, what's truth? Well, I offer that these techniques generated by programs and experiences at the Buffalo Museum of Science offer that. Science museums also stand as a trusted resource of information. Again, according to the Pew Research Center, while the very few and only 12% of respondees to their study indicated that they get their science information from science tech, uh, and technology centers or museums, Science and technology centers and museums are regarded um, most highly as being an accurate source of information. We get the science facts right most of the time, 54% of the time according to this study, but uh, markedly higher than most of the other um, segment areas. So science museums make science accessible, provide people with fundamental life skills and stand as accurate conveyors and providers of science information. But we'll go one further. The skills of a scientist, the skills of a STEM thinker, asking good questions, thinking critically, making comparisons, solving problems. These are also exactly the skills that employers say they're looking for. The respondees to the National Association of College and Employers Job Outlook 2018 survey rated critical thinking and problem solving as the most essential competency among new hires. You get those skills here at the Buffalo Museum of Science. Accessibility, job readiness, life skills. We also fundamentally elevate human knowledge. And that's a big, bold thing to say, but I stand by it. And particularly here at the Buffalo Museum of Science, where we have an extraordinary collection 
more than 700,000 objects that date back to our founding 160 years ago. We make a commitment to steward and care for those objects, but we also make a commitment to make them available to ensure that we are able to share them with our community at large so that they can be researched, so that we learn a little bit more about the natural world, the world around us, by way of the objects, artifacts, and materials that we care for. Look at this picture, um, work, individuals working in our collections and, you know, observation, sorting and classifying, process skills of science. How are the eggs in the bottom left-hand box different from the eggs in the top right-hand box? Observing. Likewise, look, observing and working together in a group. And I love this picture because I'll tell you what, while there are no doubt a bunch of lovable nerds and quirky outsiders in this picture, there's certainly a whole lot of romantic and heroic leads here as well. Science is for everyone. And at a time when the understanding and the process of science and the respect for science and the need for capability in science is higher than it has been in, in recent decades. We have to have people who appreciate that science is for all of us. We have to find a way to embrace everyone in our scientific advancement. We have to ensure that we're preparing the STEM thinkers and STEM leaders of the future from a pool that includes all of the children of today. Because otherwise we are absolutely cutting ourselves and our society and our future short in a time when those needs are greater than ever before. Now, I promised, um, I promised that I would have a tip nature preserve slide because in addition, science museums today to making science accessible and to generating fundamental life and employment skills and, um, and, and uh, elevating human knowledge and standing as an accurate resource for science information. We also uh, provide programming that is engaging, educational, entertaining for all ages. So my organization has the privilege of running the Tift Nature Preserve on the Outer Harbor, as well as the Buffalo Museum of Science. Tift Nature Preserve, the original tenant of the Outer Harbor, as we say, 264 acres, five miles of trails, an important birding uh, location as designated by the Audubon Society, and a joy to visit, to investigate, observe, engage in those science processes any time of year. And of course, we're always looking to offer something new and exciting at the Buffalo Museum of Science. And I'm pleased to give you a preview of our next exhibit opening on February 13th, Medieval to Metal, the Art and Evolution of the Guitar, which will chronicle the evolu artistic and technological evolution of the stringed instrument that is today the electric guitar opening on February 13th, free with museum admission. But of course, even before February 13th, we're open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays right now with three floors of terrific exhibits to visit and enjoy, to investigate, discover, observe, compare, iterate, and do all of those things that are part of the science process. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I appreciate your time today. Melissa, do we have any questions from our audience? We do not have any questions at this time, but Dennis, I'm sure you've got some good ones. <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's a wonderful presentation, Marisa, and, uh, and, and so timely, obviously, as you point out. Uh, how does the community support the Museum of Science? Uh, give me some numbers, like membership, sure. roughly. How many are there are, are members that uh, have committed uh, to saying we want to be aligned with this museum? Absolutely, and we're extraordinarily fortunate to, to enjoy very hearty support from, um, from the community in a variety of ways. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of before numbers and, and you know, the, the time before COVID had a, had a tremendous negative impact. You asked about members particularly. Um, up until, right, really right up until March of a year ago when our community needed to shut down, uh, we had about 8,500 members, member households. And that is actually almost the highest uh, point of membership that the society has enjoyed 
in decades. Um, so uh, so we, have, we have been building and building and over the past number of years seen a continuous upward trend in membership, um, which is just incredibly gratifying. Members, uh, of course, you pay your membership fee at one point and then you get to visit free throughout the year. You get to visit other science and technology museums who are a part of our shared industry association for free anywhere in the country. So it's really a marvelous way to, um, to uh, demonstrate your alignment with the work that we do. Beyond I, that, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say, how does that compare roughly as a percentage in your mind with your Philadelphia experience? Well, uh, yeah. What a great question. What a great question. So my Philadelphia experience, the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia, really among one of you know, the country's um, largest science museums. So a couple of, um, a couple of uh, comparative points. Here at the Buffalo Museum of Science, we generally welcome about 125,000 visitors a year when, when we have you know, programming that people are really interested in engaging. By comparison, the Franklin Institute generally welcomes about 800,000 visitors a year. Our operating budget here in Buffalo is, is just under $5 million, maybe 4.7, depending on the year. In Philadelphia, the operating budget is about $25 million. So there are some comparative points. So we here in Buffalo, again, a year ago, had about 8,500 household, um, households as members. My uh, recollection at the Franklin Institute was that they had about 35,000 households um, as members. So, um, so you know, we, we perform, I think the short answer is we really, you know, looking at that benchmark, we are performing very well. And it's an indicator that we really do offer terrific, terrific value and engagement for our community. Yeah, we serve about a million folks. And I'm not sure what the Philadelphia uh, overall market when you add the suburbs and whatnot uh, yeah. amounts to, but I, it sounds like a good healthy percentage for Buffalo. Yes, uh, indeed. Which is good news, which is good news. How about the- Dennis, we, we do have several questions now oh, from the chat. I was going to ask if you can weave in how you connect with schools. Yeah. And some of these questions, that would be sure. good. But go ahead, Melissa, give us some of those questions, please. Okay, first question. What is the age range that you are targeting with your exhibits? Um, oh, what a great question. We really do, and this, this sounds like I'm gonna give you a thoughtless answer. We serve everyone, um, and, and that's the answer, um, but, it, but it's not at all thoughtless. We really do um, work to build into our exhibits content for all ages. So when, when, you, when you've visited one of our um, core exhibits, one of our built exhibits in-house here that are here all the time in our science studios, um, you will notice that we, we have some opportunities for learning and engagement for children and others that are for adults. And we're really very, very thoughtful about, about, um, about offering something really across that education and learning spectrum. When we're bringing in a traveling exhibit, it is often the case that those exhibits are more particularly geared to an age group. Um, just before I arrived about five years ago, I know the organization had terrific success with uh, a Curious George exhibit. Really, the, uh, you know, our community really enjoyed it. That was very much an exhibit designed for a young audience. It did not you know, transition or span. Uh, more recently, we've really challenged ourselves to identify and bring in traveling exhibits that like our built exhibits um, would have, will appeal to a wider audience range. Um, I will say that the, that, uh, that the, uh, the availability of quality exhibits that do that well um, is, is sometimes limited. So that's always something where we're pushing ourselves to find what's best out there in programming to bring it here to Western New York. Next question, do you think you will extend your hours at some point since you're only open on weekends? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, so when we, uh, when we open our next visiting exhibit, Medieval to Metal on February 13th, with that exhibit opening, we will uh, extend our hours to include Wednesday and Thursday. So we'll be moving from three days a week to five days a week, Wednesday through Sunday. We absolutely look forward to building back up to full seven day a week operations. And we're really just, you know, taking incremental steps as, as part of coming out of this pandemic with our community. Next question, do you see a role for active research at our museum? Oh, terrific question. Um, so, so 
we absolutely there is a role now and we have active research ongoing at our museum and at tift nature preserve actually and we are doing that generally in partnership um with uh other individuals or other organizations who themselves take the lead in the research our role for the most part is you know generally what the researchers are researching is that primary source um, object or collection item. So our role is to ensure that it's available and it's well cared for and that it'll be available, you know, 20, 30, another 160 years from now. I think it, I mean, I, I could envision a future where museums are again generating um, the research, but that really is, uh, that, that, that's a good few years away in how we think about a museum service, primary service to its community. Someone asked if you could please put up the slide that shows the scientific process. Sure. And then another question is, do you do community outreach, which I know you've kind of touched on a little bit, but. Let me get the scientific process up here. There we go. Scientific process skills, particularly. There we are. And then uh, community outreach. Yes, indeed. So we do a wide array of community outreach. And again, in the before time, um, we we uh, had a had a, a van out in the, on the road uh, really almost every day going uh, to schools, to community groups, um, whoever wished to engage us. Um, and we had support from KeyBank to do that specifically. More recently, of course, everything needs to look different. We are pleased and gratified that we've been able to, to continue our community outreach with a couple of really terrific community partners, particularly here on Buffalo's east side. So there are partners and there are neighbors. For instance, um, King Urban Life Center, our neighbor um, just uh, across the street here, and uh, the Willie Hutch Jones program are two, um, two organizations with which we're currently doing virtual outreach. And how often do the in-house or built exhibits get updated and added to? So, um, boy, that's a great question. So I have always said, I've always been taught that the ideal best practice is to be able to change your, your sort of your built exhibits every 10 years. And that's a, you know, would we love to change them more frequently? Perhaps. But, but that's really a significant investment of capital dollars and staff time. So 10 years just seems to be the rhythm that science museums talk about. Now, I will also say that I've never worked in a museum that has been able to meet that 10 year benchmark. That's tough for the same reasons. It's a significant investment of capital dollars and staff time. So what we've done with our science studios, when we renovated all of our science studios beginning about 10 years ago, those science studios were built with the intention that we could change out components of them um, that would have a would have a positive impact or offer something new to the visitor without having to rebuild the entire science studio sort of immersive structure, which becomes that barrier because of its cost. So for instance, our artifacts science studio about two years ago, we changed out what had been the uh, primary central display of ceramics and instead are now featuring a central display of baskets. Also into that studio, we we um, added um, uh, the, our mandala, which is a fan favorite, but had not been on exhibit for a number of years. So we, uh, we are cycling through trying to uh, address two of our uh, core exhibits every year with, with, I'll use the word modest, but they really do give you the visitor a different experience with modest changes of that scale, which allow us to offer something new for the visitor to engage with at, you know, at, at, a, at an investment of time and dollars, which really is sustainable. And then uh, could you talk a little bit about TIFT? Is it, you know, open? Are families able to come? And of course, you know, is there cross country skiing available now with the snow that's out there? Terrific. Thanks for the question. TIFT. Uh, so uh, uh, TIFT Nature Preserve features the Herb and Jane Darling Environmental Education Center, um, at which we run a great array of programming in addition to it serving as a drop-in center um, that offers some resources about the flora and fauna that one um, might see when going for a walk at TIFT. 
Now, the Herb and Jane Darling Environmental Education Center remains closed because of the pandemic. However, TIFT is open as it always has been, dawn till dusk every day, available for walking, for visiting, for observation and photography. Um, you know, just a, a tremendous a, a array of activities one can enjoy at TIFF Nature Preserve. Fishing as well is actually um, a, a particular activity many, many people enjoy at TIFF. Um, we are also offering at TIFF guided nature tours for your household group or your, your safe pod. Um, you can engage with one of our talented, um, you know, TIFF um, outdoor educators and, and get a private tour of the preserve that is really going to help you and your companions get a little bit more out of your visit and, and see things you may not have seen otherwise. And you can access that programming by way of our website. We're also offering some virtual programming associated with TIFT, um, programs around, for instance, upcycling and how to um, you know, reuse um, some materials with an environmental mindset. And I know we're coming up on the hour here, Marisa, perhaps you could just go back to the slide that has your website and contact sure. information. So in case people wanna reach out to you further. Terrific, thank you. Very good. That covers all of uh, all of the questions, pretty much. And you're certainly available for uh, for additional questions. I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, that was a great presentation, and and uh, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, and most most timely. Every time my wife and I have been uh, uh, to the museum, it's been filled. I think half your members uh, choose the same days we we have. Uh, but enjoyable. People are spaced out nicely, and it's a, it's just a great experience, uh, and a and a and a great gift to this community that our ancestors created for us to enjoy. And now it's our turn to uh, make sure we leave it better than we found it. How's that? As a uh, from a development standpoint, uh, 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 thought process here. Good luck uh, raising funds to keep it going and growing. Uh, in, and sustainable. Uh, and I think we all have to think that way. The trick, by the way, with schools is to constantly figure out how to get you into the schools rather than worrying about how to get the schools into your uh, organization. But the 21st century technology is going to help us, I'm sure. All right, I will uh, wrap this up as soon as we get... Uh, uh, here we go. Well... We lost that when we transferred over. Uh, folks, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us today. Again, this is a weekly series. And uh, uh, thank you again, Marisa Wigglesworth, for telling us a great story about the Buffalo Museum of Science. Uh, next week, we're going to have Sydney Collins. Uh, she's a AmeriCorps um, uh, young lady. And we're going to be looking at the uh, sewer authority and uh, sustainability and issues of uh, water flow and how we keep our lakes and rivers uh, uh, cleaner uh, and how we participate in that as a community. So I'm looking forward to that uh, next Tuesday. Folks, thank you again for uh, supporting this program. Please tell others about it uh, every Tuesday. That's the plan. And um, uh, Hopefully we'll see you next week. Be well and have a good afternoon.